Welcome to the Teacher Transition Podcast, where we celebrate the amazing things former teachers are now doing outside of the classroom, and where teachers who are considering making a move of their own can find the resources, guidance, and support that they need to take their next steps. I'm your host, Allie Parrish, and I'm so glad that you're here. Today is a really special podcast episode because it's with Ethan and Ethan and I worked in the same district in the past and he is one of the first teachers that reached out to me for insight and guidance about the field of instructional design. Since then, Ethan has gone on to become an instructional designer at a university. He went from being a fifth grade teacher and working a lot of side jobs to provide for his family the way that he wanted to, to being a full-time instructional designer at a university where he can do one thing that he loves and where he makes more than what he would have made after more than a decade more of teaching in the classroom. So go ahead and let's learn from him and his personal path. I love that his wife joins us in this episode as well. And I'm so excited for you to hear everything that he has to share. We are so lucky to have some special guests with us today. We have Ethan DeCuster and his wife, Tiana. Ethan and Tiana, thanks so much for both being willing to be yeah. on the show today. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Yeah. But, so funny story, Ethan and I go way back to the same district where we taught years ago, Nebo mm-hmm. School District in That's Utah. A right. little shout out to our former district. That's right. And we were going to be on the same team teaching fifth grade until I saw uh, that the grass was greener in Southern Utah instead of northern Utah, and I made the which, move down here. <laughs> which kind of makes no sense because it's all red rock now. <laughs> They're true. That's beautiful. true. There is no grass. We have no That's grass. That's right. Front yards are, are like dirt, like mm-hmm. stone formations, rocks. right? Like That's right. <laughs> decorating with different colors of rocks. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. So yeah, tell us what took you, it was family, right? That took you from teaching up north to teaching down south? Yeah. So Tiana and I both grew up in California and the plan when we were, you know, at BYU was to graduate and move back to California. Well, that was around 2010 and things weren't looking too good there, especially for teachers. I had a few teacher friends in California during that time and every year they get a pink slip because the economy and everything was just not doing well and California was really struggling really bad and all that. So we thought we don't want to really get back into that but my brother lived in St. George Utah which is right on the border of Arizona Nevada so right there in the southwest corner only a 6 hour drive to Tiana's parents house so there's palm trees it's nice and warm no snow we thought this is a good compromise <laughs> so we decided kind to of- stay in Utah and uh, enjoy the warmer California ish weather <laughs> and uh, so followed my brother down here and since then, I had another brother move here and a sister move here and my parents move here. So the decusters are kind of taken over and it's a lot of fun to have a lot of family nearby. So we're here. That's to great. Yep. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. But if you were to take us back, well, you mentioned that you went to BYU, Brigham Young University. Yep. But take us back way before that to when you were a kid. Sure. What did you want to be when you grew up? And I was a little, I have four older brothers. And so basically I just wanted to be and do anything that they wanted to do. But once my brothers all moved out of the house and I was kind of left, the oldest one, I started, I love to play the guitar. That's something I started as a teenager. And I started teaching guitar lessons to kids in my neighborhood, you know, 10 through 13 year old kids that wanted to learn how to play guitar. And I really, really enjoyed that. And so I kind of found that I love music, but I didn't really want to make music a career. I thought that would kind of kill it for me. It wouldn't be fun. And I had heard all sorts of horror stories about how hard it is to make it as a musician. So I decided to be a teacher because, you know, <laughs> it's not hard to make it as a teacher. Uh, but no, I, I, I really loved working with kids and I really had this passion for uh, communicating and building relationships. And it really made me proud to see these kids learn and grow and they're playing the guitar and the joy that it brought to them and that just made me feel really good and so early on I felt that satisfaction of teaching and working with kids and decided uh 
to, to pursue that in, the, in college. So I was one of the lucky ones where we were graduating high school. Most of my friends had no idea what they wanted to do with their life. And I had a very clear idea of myself being an elementary school teacher. Great. And so did you start at Nebo right out of school or did you teach in any other districts? Before, no, I did it. I did an internship. Uh, my cohort was in Nebo and my practicum was in Nebo. And that's kind of the way that they did it. They had these partnerships with different districts around the university. So I did an internship in fifth grade, which was awesome. You get a you get your own class. It's not like student teaching where you're kind of an apprentice to a full-time teacher. You have your own class, your own students, and then you have a coach at the school that works with you. And you also have professors from the university that work with you. You still turn in a teacher work sample and all that kind of stuff, but you get paid. <laughs> Half salary. <laughs> Half salary right. was big bucks back then. I think we were living off of what, nine fifty a month. Yeah. We had a brand new baby. The first two weeks I was a teacher, our first daughter Mackenzie was born and Tiana stopped working at that point. So I was the sole income at $950 a month and we've never been happier. <laughs> Well, we requested the Nebo School District because that was the school district that I was teaching at. So we had one car and we had to make that work. Yeah, exactly. Plus people in that district already knew how to say our last name. So yeah. That helped. Good. Anyway, yeah. so then after that internship year at uh, in Payson, Utah, the principal there, he was a really great guy and he got transferred schools uh, to Spanish Fork, Utah. And so he brought me along with him and gave me a full-time position there. That's great. So that, that's where I taught my second year. And then from there, moved down to St. George. Great. And I, I taught for him as well. Shout out to Ryan Pitcher. Awesome <laughs> principal. Yeah, he's really amazing. He, he's really I really awesome. looked up to him and wanted to be just like him. Right. He's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Okay, so you graduated in 2011. And then you were teaching elementary school. What did you love about teaching and about the field and um, what were some things that maybe you didn't love yeah well there's a long list here and i could talk your ear off about the things that i love about teaching and uh I, number one is just the kids working with the kids and like i said before forming the relationships i'm really a people person and i love i love children they're just they're just a lot of fun and really sweet kind and anyway so getting notes from them and and things like that. There's one kid my first year in particular that really sealed the deal for me where I'm like, this is what I was meant to do. He was really struggling, he hated school, hated teachers and all this stuff. And he and I just really clicked and kind of turned it around. He made like two and a half years worth of progress in his reading level that year. And more importantly, in my opinion, he kind of changed his attitude about school and learning. I, I really like using my sense of humor and kind of getting the kids laughing and edutainment as we call it i like to write songs for them and play my guitar for them and try and make uh the the content more interesting so involving stories involving music involving movement you know when we did the boston tea party i set up a bunch of boxes up on top of a table and played really loud heavy metal music and had the kids rush up and grab boxes and throw them on the ground and shout no taxation without representation Stuff like that really get their blood boiling and, you know, help them to try and experience what some of those early patriots uh, were going through. And anyway, that's so, awesome. Yeah, I really love doing stuff like that. You can be so creative in the classroom. And, you know, they have these programs that they tell you and it's standardized testing. And some teachers just get really hung up on that. And I tried to do my best to keep those in the back of my mind and just focus more on the kids' experience at school, make them love learning, make them you know, help them with their skills of, of being friends. I often told them that <clears throat> if Mr. D could choose between you being a perfect reader or a perfect friend after you leave my class, which one do you think I would rather have? And they all knew, you know, I, I really felt like the social skills and the interpersonal skills and things like that were of more importance than what was on the standardized tests. And so, you know, I never had like horrible test scores, but I never had like the highest test scores. And uh, yeah. that, we were fine with that, all the kids. And anyway, so I, I really love working with the kids and, and all that challenges that I had. My number one was um, just when things weren't going well with classroom management, bad behaviors. I, 
I didn't feel like I ever really got the hang of that, like controlling children <laughs> and, you know, herding cats, as they say. That was my least favorite part for sure. You know, having to having to get strict or tough on kids and try to correct certain behaviors that that was that was always kind of hard for me. And it it's hard because I want everyone to get along. I want everybody to be happy. And when I've got a kid throwing a chair across the room, like it just kind of ruins my day, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, it's probably because I taught him to throw boxes at the bus and tea party. So I think it's my <laughs> fault. It's all coming full, full circle. <laughs> okay. Then the next thing you know, he's going to smash my computer to pieces. Hilarious. Anyway. Oh, so, okay. So you graduated in 2011. You were in the, the district where you started teaching. And when did you kind of start feeling the bug or... Yeah. What, tell us your transition story from the classroom yeah. to what you do now. So, so a really important part of that, going back to that internship year where we're making less than a thousand dollars a month and trying to support a family on that. That was, that was hard. I know I'm kind of joking about it, but it was, it was really tough. And so a great opportunity that came my way, I was checking Craigslist for other ways to earn money was a music store down the street hiring a guitar instructor. And so I thought, hey, I've done this before. I, I taught lessons when I was at home in California and I uh, taught a few lessons here and there during college. You know, I drive to people's houses. This was a music store offering music lessons to, you know, a list of 30 students or something. And each one, you know, you get X amount per month. So it's going to be a great supplement to my income. So I was very fortunate that um, I got to work there and worked with a really cool guy they're at uh, Mountain Rock Music, it's called, and was able to supplement my income. And so we were able to kind of make ends meet and live a little more comfortably. Well, <clears throat> fast forward down to St. George, the, the guy that worked at Mountain Rock Music had a connection here at the music store. And so he connected me with him. And so now I've, I've, this has just become part of the gig. Like I teach during the day. I get there early to prep because I won't have any time after school. Because after school, I go directly to guitar lessons until about six or seven at night, depending on the day. So I'd wake up and get to school by seven, seven thirty. Prep. School starts at nine. Gets out at three thirty. I'm contracted to be there till four. Stay there till four. My first lesson starts at four thirty. So I drive over to the music store, and then I'm there for a few hours and come home late. And anyway, so that was kind of the the way it worked. And then I, on top of that, I. We we were able to buy a home, and so now I needed to <laughs> earn even more. I started working with one of my teacher friends with a catering company, and now all of a sudden my weekends, Friday nights and often Saturday nights, I'm out working parties and weddings and stuff like that, helping set up and take down for a catering company. And wow. my brother, he offered me some training in web design and web development, so I started working with him some afternoons on the weekends and stuff like that, especially during the summertime, I'd come into his office and help him with his websites and some of the work he was doing there. And I was just kind of running myself ragged. So when you ask about the bug, it for me, it was just kind of getting burned out on working all these different jobs. A lot of people ask me, well, why don't you just have Tiana teach? She was a teacher. She has a degree. Get the two teacher income and there you go. And the reason for that is because it's extremely important um, to the two of us for Tiana to be able to raise our children, especially when they're very young. And so we had Mackenzie in 2010, and then the rest of our kids came within how many years, T? Four and a half. Four and a half years, four kids. <laughs> so wow. Tiana was, yeah, she was either pregnant or nursing pretty much that whole time. You guys are um, amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> so, you are a blur. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Tiana, tough. what was going through your mind all of this time as you're seeing Ethan? doing a lot of different jobs and kind of trying new stuff and things here and there. How was that? Oh, I grew up, my dad, my dad was a teacher. He was a high school teacher and um, still is. So I, and he would always take extra jobs, summer school, coaching, extra classes. So I was kind of used to that already. And we had talked about when we were um, still in school, what our plans would be. And he wanted to be a teacher and I was willing to support him in that. But then I told him, I was like, you've got to make sure, you know, that you have other sources of income to help um, support that. So he was willing to do that. 
a hard worker and she was okay with that. Um, the plan that we kind of had from the beginning was for him to always go back and get a master's in his education way, but we weren't sure what he was going to do with it. He kind of always, the default answer is to go into administration, but he wasn't really feeling that. So these last few years, since he graduated, what you taught eight years. Mm -hmm. So the first like five years he was teaching, it was kind of just feeling it out and trying to get a sense for what he wanted to do when he left teaching. And it took him a while to figure that out, which is, you know, fine. But yeah, working all the extra jobs and stuff, it was a little hard. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so yeah, I just kind of got burned out after doing all this work, all these jobs and thinking, I just can't do this forever. And I'm looking at the long term. My kids are getting bigger. My kids are starting to enter school. And I'm looking at the salary, you know, in a school district, they just got these steps. And they used to have lanes. Now they've just consolidated it to one lane with a bunch of steps. And each step is a year that you teach. And each year it's an $800 raise. $800. So I would have to teach in order to, you know, get to a more comfortable salary, you gotta teach for decades, you know, and in the meantime, my kids are growing up and I want to provide better for them anyway. So that's when, that's when I figured I, and this was the hardest decision, but to me it was, I need to put my own children ahead of these other kids that I'm working with. And that's really hard because I love my students and I love working with kids um, in a school setting. But if I'm being honest, I love my own children more. And so making that decision to then leave the classroom and, and I, like Tiana said, I was trying to kind of for five years to see how I can make that work. And, you know, oh, I, I can just keep being a teacher. I can have both, you know, but, you know, the other option was to have Tiana go and work and that wasn't really an option for us or just continue to kind of uh, struggle financially. I, I don't want to say struggle. I mean, we were always fine, but I mean, there were times when we needed like assistance, WIC um, program and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. just wanted to be more independent and have some savings and, you know, be able to pay for our kids stuff as they grow. And anyway, so that's when totally I started looking into what the, what master's program do I want to do? And the resources you're describing sound great because I spent a lot of time uh, trying to look into, you know, starting at Google, what do teachers do after teaching or <laughs> whatever? And there's like not a whole lot out there. Yeah. So instead, I'm just trying to look at like, I took a few of those tests, you know, where you say you fill out answer questions and it says, based on your aptitude, here's a great job for you. You know, I even considered like completely cutting across disciplines and going into something completely different. But that, to me, I, I'm an educator. I feel like that's kind of my mission, my purpose, and I really wanted to stay within education somewhere. So, anyway. do you do you remember some of the other things that you considered that were totally different things? Um, yeah. So I, as I said, my brother got me into kind of learning some web design stuff, and so I was kind of self-taught HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and I really enjoyed that, like the challenge of. I want to make the website do this, or I want to make this little text box look this way. How can I make that happen? And then solving that problem and getting it to do that was very rewarding. And I, I know that, you know, they make a lot of money. And so that was one of the things that I considered uh, the you most. Like being a principal, but I mean, being yeah. a principal job is so hard. The, everyone that wants to advance yep. education usually goes for that. And he, you weren't really into the disciplining children <laughs> yeah exactly so my again i said earlier my least favorite thing was management and i feel like that's 100 percent of what principals do you manage parents that are mad you manage kids that are bad you you know you manage budgets that are sad so yeah it didn't seem like something that would make me glad yeah and i like how you made all of that rhyme I, I i'm see a the, poet the music side inside, yeah in. exactly i'm a musician a poet. i just can't help it Anyway, so yeah, that thought didn't last too long when I looked at principals, but every male teacher that I know ha was going to get educational leadership masters or whatever and become a principal. And every every guy that I knew that had done that was struggling to get his foot in the door right. because it's really competitive and everybody's got an educational leadership masters because they're not creative enough, I guess, to find other avenues of where they could go. Or maybe that really is their passion, but um, I think 
fact that a lot of these guys are doing that, it's because they want that pay raise. Anyway, so I kind of married the two of those and found instructional technology. And that was all about helping people learn with technology and computers. So it's still an education, but it incorporates some of that newfound interest and passion for coding and technology and stuff like that. So people think it's kind of funny because I'm a little bit of like a uh, technophobe, neolidite, whatever you want to say. Like you can ask Tiana, I don't know when we started paying for texting, but I was like anti-texting. I told everybody it's the downfall of our generation. Yeah. Communicating without your voice, just, you know, sending these texts is going to destroy children. And <laughs> and now I, now I work in instructional technology and help people take online classes and stuff. So there you go. <laughs> I try and make it real. I try and make it more personal. I try and just play out more onto the human connection. Which is so important to have in instruction, in the instructional design field. Mm -hmm. And especially if something's online learning, helping it be a very human experience. Yeah. The ability to design that way is is powerful. So I've spent a lot of time researching like social constructivist learning theory in online courses and stuff and use the use of asynchronous and synchronous interactions. And so it's pretty interesting. That's something I've really enjoyed is kind of learning more about a new field. So, you know, how, how, what's the zone of proximal development? How could a computer help you determine that and then assist a teacher in better instructing and intervening with students? Great. Okay. So you've mentioned obviously being a teacher and you've mentioned some things about a little bit about your master's program. Is there anything else that you'd add? I, I mean, you chose the grad school route. Why don't, yeah. Do you mind telling us about that? Maybe if a teacher is considering instructional design, right? I know you and I, when, when we chatted back in the day, when you were trying to figure, you know, to, to look into instructional design while I was doing it, I think you asked about schools and yeah. things like that. Give us insight in into yes. how you, where you applied or, or things, anything you think a teacher would want to know. So we, as I said, we owned a home in St. George. And so we weren't interested in continuing to just move around or wherever I knew that I, I wanted to stay there and my kids needed to get some roots. My grandparents were here now and all that kind of stuff. So I wasn't really looking at um, moving away from St. George, which is kind of a smaller community. So it would be tough to find much opportunity outside of some sort of online training or certification um, or master's program. So I started looking around and I start, yeah, I kind of did a national search of different schools that would work for that. And for this particular field, I actually began by looking at the job postings and what employers wanted. I feel like I don't need to get a master's if they're hiring people without that, then, you know, why, why spend the time and, and student debt? So that, unfortunately, that was something that was a very recurring pattern, master's degree required, master's degree required over and over in all these different positions that I was looking at. So I thought, well, I think this is going to be necessary for me to to get my foot in the door and to pursue this option. So that's why I decided to do grad school. But now that I've worked at a university, I definitely encourage people, don't go to college unless your job requires it. Like if you don't have to go and get into debt and spend the time, just start working and start and get a certification of some kind or get training on other different skills that employers want. But this this happened to be a field that required a degree. So Utah State had a great tuition because I was a resident of Utah and had a really great reputation for their instructional technology and learning science department. So that was what I did. And I luckily, I had the foresight upon graduating from BYU to take the GRE because I thought at some point I'm going to want to do the master's thing. So... How did you go about getting a job after graduating? So, yeah, I during the time I was there, I knew that it was going to be really important for me to make connections with people. And so I thought one of the best ways to do that was by doing the internship option instead of the creative project or whatever other options there were. So I knew the internship undergrad was so critical to get that year of teaching experience. That's really what helped me start off my uh, teaching career. So with this master's, I knew I wanted an internship, but I'm working full time. And by the way, can I just add one thing before I get into this too much? Of course. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned all of my busy schedule before. Now I'm adding 
classes online, you know, six credits a semester during the school year, nine credits during the summer. So now my schedule is school at seven, guitar lessons at 4.30, dinner at 7 p.m., classes from 8 to 11 p.m. So wow, yeah, now it's it was really, if I thought I was burned out before, like this really pushed me to my limits but, to do it. So it, it is very tough to work full time and do classes. But we knew there was an end in sight. It wasn't going to last forever. It was like, this is worth it to make the sacrifice to mm-hmm. go to school for two years, you know, so that hopefully it can end right. up in just one job. Yeah, because now I work nine to five and right. it's great. And I awesome. make just as much money as I did with all the other jobs combined. So. Um, yeah, it really is like an investment, right? Yeah, an investment is. of education, and it was hard. I felt kind of like a bad dad, you know. <laughs> I'd only see my kids for like an hour a night, Monday to Thursday. Anyway, so it was tough to work through that, but super interesting stuff. I really enjoyed the classes. I enjoyed learning about online learning by taking online learning. It was a very right. meta experience, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, connecting with these different professors. And then I started to connect with the local university, Dixie State in St. George and just kind of approached their online department and said, Hey, I just want you to know I'm a local here. I'm enrolled in this master's program later next year. I would like to do an internship kind of making a connection with them. And they were very interested. They thought that sounds great. And Um, did the fact that you were doing Utah state's master's specifically, did that pique their attention? Cause Utah state has incredible street cred. Yeah, it did. And it's, it's another UC school, Utah system of higher education. So, you know, we're all kind of in this group in Utah. And so they know a lot of the people there. Two of the other guys that work there have the same master's degree that I got. So they know, you know, there was was a really good connection. So I I think it's also, that's a good point that if you're going to get a master's degree, trying to get one somewhere a little more, you know, local or at least within your state is a good way to make some of those connections. So yeah, I just approached them and then we kind of left it at that. I kept working on my classes. In the meantime, I got connected. There's a guy that one of the deans at the university had invested in a, a local business called Code Changers. And so I met with them and they do like after school programs for kids to teach them coding and summer camps for kids. And so that was like right up my alley. So I ended up doing my internship with them and designing some perfect, of their because it was summer camps during the summer when that you had off right for teaching. exactly perfect. and you they, had the time to do it yeah and they paid me too which is awesome so i <laughs> some designed some of their online content and classes and then i also um, taught in their summer camps a lot of fun to work with these kids you know for four days and kind of do crash course into coding and robotics and stuff like that so that was really fun but he was not at a place yet the the guy running the business not at a place to offer me a full-time spot. So it was it was a good open window, but it was not really something I was willing to trade off yet. Like my secure teaching job with full-time benefits and all that kind of stuff to go and work with a little startup and, you know, who knows. But anyway, so then at that point, I started just emailing everybody I knew because now I'm graduating. So I emailed like people that knew my family, like my some of my dad's contacts people from the Nebo school district and everywhere, just kind of trying to put out some feelers. I applied for dozens of jobs just through, you know, like uh, Indeed or Glassdoor or whatever those different, I can't remember what they all are, but um, just kind of throwing a Hail Mary out there because I didn't really have instructional design experience. I had a lot of teaching experience, but anyway, I, I connected with the director again at Dixie State and he kind of took a chance on me and thought, you know, this guy seems eager. He seems smart. He seems persistent. Let's just kind of see what he's got. So he threw one project at me to work on an education course with one of the education faculty. And I knew that this was my golden opportunity. So I put 110% into it and went overboard on it. And he was very impressed. And uh, the faculty member was very impressed and everybody seemed really happy with my work. So this was only a part-time deal. I'm still teaching full-time at school. Um, But I quit guitar lessons in order to free up some time to do this project. And they paid me for the project as a contract worker, you know. But that was my foot in the door that eventually led the following summer to full-time employment at the university. This is so full of so many just 
oh, big, you know, golden nuggets. There's so many great things in what you're saying. Part of what's coming to my mind is some teachers, you know, myself included, that can't see what is in the future. You know, like you wouldn't have been able to see that summer opportunity right. of teaching while you were in the classroom or before enrolling in the program. Do you have any advice for teachers that are, I don't want to say sitting still, but are a little fearful of taking yeah. step one and two when they can't see step seven and eight? Yeah, that's a really good point because I can speak very confidently now based on where I'm at and looking back in retrospect, but I was very afraid as well. I mean, this was like all I could think about for that whole time, like that summer and and then trying to get a job after and just thinking like, you know, it, it's not the end of the world if I continue teaching and kind of doing things the way I've been doing it. And I, I had the faith that eventually something's going to work out somewhere, but I always thought that it would be somewhere else. And that was something that we were a little nervous about was we really love this area where we live and we're starting to set down these roots and our kids are making friends and they have their grandparents and their cousins. It's a really cool community. We love this area, but the instructional design jobs are elsewhere. They're in California, they're in Northern Utah, they're in Georgia, right. wherever. And so I was always a little nervous that, you know, maybe I could find a remote position. I doubt someone would give a, a newbie a remote position like that. And, and basically what it came down to was this, if I, we set a number, and if there's a job that can exceed this number that's somewhere else, we'll do it. But otherwise, the quality of life that we have here, you know, when you think about a teacher's salary, that's the other thing that I, that I often tell people is that it's not just about the money you make. It's about the feeling you get from your jobs, feeling very, a lot of meaning from teaching kids and all the other things that come with it, the time off during the summer, you know, the, the just feeling of satisfaction. That's something that you can't really put a price on. And so the life that I had, yeah, I was getting kind of run ragged trying to make ends meet financially. But in my job, I loved going to my work most days. And, you know, it was it was really rewarding and besides just with money. So money's not everything, but it was starting to become more and more important to me. And so we, you know, we said if there's a certain number of jobs somewhere else, we'll go there. But we yeah. just kind of felt like, you know what, we'll keep doing the best that we can and raising our family right and doing the things that we know are, are right and, and working hard, taking opportunities and not just kind of sitting back and waiting for something to happen. So yeah. if I hadn't emailed all these people, I'd probably still be teaching and wondering when's, when's it going to happen for me? Yeah. You have to right. I do have a lot of instructional designers who, after they do a grad program, they'll reach out and they'll be like, okay, hey, I've graduated, but mm -hmm. how do I get a job now? Yeah. And they're, there's still kind of this canyon in between universities and the workforce. And anyway, so I guess that's great. What I would say to people in that spot is that it's okay and it's totally normal to kind of be nervous about it, but you just got to keep moving forward. And as you do, your skills improve, you make new connections with people, and things just kind of start to fall into place. And if you if you have to move or relocate. I don't, I can't really say a whole lot about that because it worked out where I didn't have to do that. But I would say, you know, just look at the quality of life of what you're kind of willing to sacrifice to get that new job. So That's great. And thanks for your example of, you know, being proactive about it as well and reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the kids and, you know, how valuable it is to the interaction with them. I think a lot of teachers are afraid of things that they're going to miss. Yeah. Is there anything that you miss about teaching? Are there things that you don't miss? You, you've you mentioned that uh, financial reasons are a big right. part of why you pursued something else, but yeah, it any is. insights about teachers that are like afraid of what they're going to miss or things that you love in your job now that you didn't necessarily experience as a teacher? Anything yeah, along any of those lines? Absolutely. Yes. So for me, I think, like you said, when you're young, so I was 24. I think when I first started teaching and just wanted to change the world and who cares about money and all this kind of stuff, right? You have no real foresight into like one day I'm going to have to retire or, or um, one day I'm going to have children that need uh, a car or whatever. You know, you don't think about any of that stuff. You just kind of think about the here and now. And so I was definitely that way. I wasn't really looking ahead too much. So I think as I grew older 
think I was 30 years old when I started the master's. And so now my kids are getting older and I'm starting to kind of just mature a little bit and look a little bit more down the line. I started to kind of think about what made sense for me and my family because that's always been my priority. And I used to think, like I said, I could make, I could do both, kind of have my cake and eat it too. But then I started to realize just the, the reality of finances kind of sank in. And yes, I, I really miss working with kids a lot. I miss the energy. I miss the variety. I miss the fun stories. I miss the laughter because now I sit in an office that's quiet and which is nice at times, you know, there are mornings when you're kind of tired and you don't really feel like, you know, getting up in front of a group of students and talking for six hours or whatever. I definitely had hard days like that when I was a teacher. And I don't miss the fact that there's this show time, you know, every nine o'clock they're in your, their bell rings and they're in your classroom and you better be on and you better be ready. And even if you're not, <laughs> you still got to fake it. And yeah. anyway, so that is certain stresses from teaching that I don't feel anymore. I don't have that kind of my, I feel like my stress has gone way down. That's been a perk, but I also miss a lot of that interaction with people. Yeah. So there are some, certain things that I miss that I, I was willing now at this point to sacrifice because um, I want to better provide for my, for my family in the coming years. And so the fact that I was able to, within my first six months, get a raise that was equivalent to five years of teaching. And then uh, after four more months, get another raise. And so at this point, it would have taken me 12 years of these steps on the, on the teacher salary to get to where I am. I, and I haven't been there a year yet at the university. Just to repeat that for everyone, it, you've, again, some of your needs were financially related. Mm -hmm. And in less than one year of work there, you have made as much as you would have made after 12 years of teaching yeah. and increased pay. Did I say that right? Yes, that's correct. Now, if I, when you factor in all my guitar lessons and all my other hustle jobs, <laughs> that's different. You know, that supplemental income right. would add more, but I'm just talking about apples to apples. My job now is just teaching. It was basically a 12 year uh, bump in my pay. And so yeah. I'm really, really satisfied with that and really happy that the university, you know, values my position enough to do that. And I feel a lot of stability there. I feel really important. I feel like a critical part of their team. Whereas with teaching, like you're replaceable. When I, when I put in my thing, they're like, okay, great. But yeah. Okay. Just do this. This and all right. See you later. And they've got someone else in there immediately. Yeah. So I got offered this job at the university on the second day of school. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Tell it. Yeah. So I interviewed I on August 2nd and then they're like, yeah, we'll get back to you. And I tell my principal, I'm like, I want you to, you know, and I'd been talking to her all summer. Mm -hmm. There's probably this position opening up. I've applied. I'm going to interview just so you know, but rest assured, like I'm prepping, like I'm going to teach this whole year for you. Like I'm not just going to half-heartedly start the school year wondering and waiting to get a new job. Like I'm, I'm planning on being a teacher. So I start the first day of school on fire and these kids come in. I'm like, Hey kids, I'm going to be your teacher. We're going to have the greatest time ever. And then the second day of school, they come back and I'm like, so guys, actually, after Labor Day, you're going to have a new teacher. I'm out of here. <laughs> I had to leave, but I thought that might scar them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway. You know, that's a really great example of, of when you do what's best for you, you're doing what's best for everyone in many, many cases. I remember when when we were about to be team teachers and when you went to St. George, I, I know a lot of people hesitate of like, oh, but I committed to this. Yeah. And they kind of um, not mm -hmm. obligate themselves, but, but really they feel very obligated. Anytime a teacher takes a different opportunity, it opens up an opportunity for another teacher. Right. right. And, you know, the teacher that taught in that place the next year had been looking for a job and Exactly. Anyway, just yeah, fluctuation other, is not necessarily a bad thing, but the other way I that I for yourself is a great guide. It was difficult for me to look these kids in the face and say, you know, I'm sorry I'm not finishing the school year out with you guys. I, I just got to bail. But the school district in my opinion is not very committed to me. And they did literally nothing to try and keep me. So, if if you approach in other in professions, you approach say, "Hey, I'm considering going with this other job and blah blah." your employer would probably sit down with you and say, let's talk, let's figure out what's going on and what we need to do to help you out and whatever. 
I felt like I was one of the hardest working teachers in my staff and never once got any sort of monetary incentive for the different things that I was doing, producing different lesson plans, you know, putting on like a poetry night with parents and stuff like that, all these different things and hard work that I was doing and getting zero dollars for any of it. So I had no incentive really. Like I, I found this very frustrating that the teacher down the hall that's been teaching for 25 years, is just trying to get her pension has literally no interest in the kids anymore. And it's just kind of showing up half the day's not even showing up just, Oh, I'm sick or whatever. And because of the years, she's getting paid a lot more than me just because I've been teaching less years, but she's working way less than I am. And you know what I mean? Like the, the heart's not there, the work's not there, but she's getting paid way more. And it not was very frustrating. Yeah. Long yeah. So I liked how like in this job, when I'm working harder, they're recognizing that and they're rewarding that. And that was something that I, that was frustrating, not just financially, but just how about a little recognition? Like principal, if you really wanted to just like make up a fake award, <laughs> call right. everyone down and be like, Hey, everyone, Ethan is an amazing teacher and he's been doing this and his students said this and we got this report. We are giving him this fake award, <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> I'd be thrilled. But anyway. Yeah. So like you I know, said, the commitment I didn't feel like was both ways. Tiana, do you have anything, uh, you know, as as Ethan's wife, seeing him all the time, any insights into quality of life or yeah. Some teachers get to such a stagnant state that their happiness and well-being and things like that are in challenging spots. And it sounds like maybe Ethan transitioned well before some of that came about. But any insights you'd like to add about maybe for significant others of t transitioning teachers out there? Yes. Well, there are a few positives. Like he comes home and he's more patient with our own kids because he's not emotionally drained from dealing with 30, you know, other kids. He's not as tired. because He's not working as many hours. And I sit a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, but that's a con, right? Like he comes home and he's not as tired, but he's also needs to find another way to get that energy out. Yeah. The hours are a lot better for our family. I, I, that would, that's probably the biggest change. The best change is He's gone, you know, just a regular nine to five instead of seven to 10 at night. And the nine to five also is flexible. I could go eight to four. I could go, you know, put more hours on one day. There was some, the first day of work, I approached my boss and I'm like, today's my daughter's birthday and we were going to do something special. Oh yeah, no problem. For it. Yeah. You know, and I've taken time off to go to kids things at school. So I'm still at the school and being involved that way. And I'm, I'm able to just go, you know, at any time and kind of take time off. In fact, this is a funny story. And then Tiana will continue telling about how wonderful our new life is. But <laughs> well, my first day of work and the teachers out there are definitely going to understand this. First day of work, I'm sitting there at my computer, kind of getting things figured out. I had to go to the bathroom. And you know what I did? I stood up. I walked out the door. I went to the bathroom and I came back in <laughs> and I went to my boss's office. I knocked on the door. He goes, Oh yeah, come in. Is there, you need something like, I just want you to know, and this is a really big deal to me that I had to go to the bathroom and I just went <laughs> and came back. No questions asked. There was no problem with me just going to the bathroom in the middle of the day. <laughs> and that is a you huge perk. <laughs> I love that you went and told your boss that. Yeah. He looked at that me so puzzled. So I'm like, you never taught in a classroom, did you? He's like, no, I'm like, no okay, no, <laughs> you don't get it anyway. But That's the teachers so out there funny. know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, people yeah. always ask me, they say, oh, I'm at the university now. And they say, what do you teach? Yeah. And I tell them, I don't, I don't teach really. I work with teachers to help them make their courses and then they teach them, you know? Yeah. One of the, one of the hardest things that, that was get or leading up to my changing jobs was that just feeling kind of like a sellout, you know, like, <laughs> Oh, the 24 year old version of Ethan would have looked at me now and been like, God, you're such a sellout. Like, what about the, the kids that really need you? And you're, you're just turning your back on them because you want to get paid more or whatever. But kind of have evolved from that mindset to the fact that my kind of um, progressing and I'm still an educator, but in a different capacity. And I'm still 
improving learning and I'm still helping people to better themselves through education. It's just a little more indirect and in a different medium than in the classroom with kids. But, you know, I don't know if in five or 10 or 15 years, if I might take another step and say, you know, I need to make another advancement in my career. I kind of wrestled with that for a while, but again, what, and what I kind of end up coming back to every time is I, I need to be there for my family financially and just with my time, spend time with my kids. I read with my kids every night now and we read books together and play games together. It's really clear that you value your family. It's really clear that you have a reduced stress load. Things that you mentioned about, you know, maybe I'll, I'll keep doing more and do something different in the future. Mm -hmm. Like I think, you know, maybe something along the same career path, but right. I, oftentimes it's not a final destination. It's really the fact that we're continuing the journey right. and a career path is that word of path because we continue to go forward and allowing ourselves the freedom to do that, I think is, is so important. You mentioned briefly a few minutes ago that you help teachers uh -huh. prepare to teach like basically what do you do <laughs> at dixie state university yeah. as an instructional des designer yeah. you know like generally what do you do and maybe what does a regular day look like can i tell you one and, thing that, yeah yeah from Go ahead, sorry. being a teacher one of the greatest perks is when somebody asks me what do you do i say i'm a fifth grade teacher and they know exactly what that is they <laughs> picture it in their mind and they know exactly what i'm talking about and now everybody just does what you just did they're like so what do you do? I'm a learning designer at Dixie State. Okay, like, what does that mean, you know? So I have to end up and explain it all. So my job now as a learning designer is to work with faculty that are going to teach online and they don't know how to design for online. So teaching in a classroom and teaching online are pretty, pretty different, especially the level of preparedness and design and stuff that has to go into it beforehand when you're teaching online where all the content is there. So my job is to help work with a subject matter expert to create an online course and then, you know, make it pass our standards. And then they're prepared to uh, deliver that course in the semester. And into the future, the, our department's both digital and extended learning. And in the future, they're wanting to do more adult learning and, you know, continued learning and things like that. So I'll probably end up working a lot on courses that are just kind of like micro courses or certification courses or uh, programs that are meant to target a different audience than just our base at the campus. But anyway, for now, my that's my main job is designing and developing online courses for faculty. That's great. And then what does maybe a regular nine to five day look like for you? So I'll come in and check the emails and put out any fires that might pop up. <laughs> this isn't working. My students are trying to do this and it won't work or whatever, you know, I fix some bugs. So I'll, you know, I'll do email and kind of map out my day. I'll spend time on each of the courses. I'm usually working on about four or five courses at once. And so I'll kind of take an hour and a half to two hours for courses. Then, yeah, I, I also spend some time doing research. I like to sharpen the saw, as they say. So I'll just read other papers or look at other universities or just kind of see what I can do to improve what we're doing. I've gotten a ton of really great ideas by doing that. And then I also spend some time just meeting working on like bugs and fixes. Yeah, going to meetings is a big part of it. Meeting with professors weekly. But I, I like I love to look at something in the learning management system. We use Canvas and saying, this doesn't work the way I like it to. Is there a way that I can make that different or customize it a little bit? And then I get to do some of that old HTML, CSS kind of solve this problem stuff. And it's, I enjoy that too, but that's a more minor part of my job. Most of it is meeting with professors and helping put together their courses. on Everything that you just described as your job is so different from the instructional design work that I did at a learning production agency, right. like at an instructional design agency. And or there wasn't really, are you in an office that has like its own walls by yourself? Not yet. Not yet. We've been, okay. we've grew out of our original office space. So we're kind of, I, they've converted a conference room <laughs> into these little nooks for us, but they're okay. uh, remodeling one of the buildings and one of the wings is going to be just for our department and we'll have our own office space. Yeah. 
Yeah. Interesting. It's all so different. The, yeah. Different places where I've worked, if it was an agency or a large corporation, mm-hmm. there was quite a bit of interaction with coworkers because we're all sitting right together and collaborating on creating courses and things like that. But mm-hmm. yeah, just, just what you said has really reminded me that, yeah, that it's very different in different settings. Thanks yeah. for that. Okay. So K large 16 asked, could he share about the differences between working for a university versus working for a district or private school corporation? How did he get his foot in the door and what types of higher education would he recommend for working in a university setting? Yeah. Some of that we've probably already addressed, but is there anything more that you'd yeah, add so, to what we've shared? Like I just said, you want a master's of education. It's a little bit different. I mean, it's not super different, but they, they told me that's more of what the universities will look at. It's pretty different. The district is a lot more didactic and the way we do things. There's a system, there's like, there's policy out the wazoo, like, and you have to study it. I remember sitting through staff meetings and like reading policy out loud, <laughs> stuff like that. I was shocked my first day at the university. They're like, all right, we've got this orientation you're going to go to. So I show up and I'm just waiting for the policy, you know, and they're like, all right, this is this, how your health insurance works and blah, blah, blah. Any questions? I raised my hand. I literally, I said, so when are we going to like read all the policies and stuff? (laughs) They're like, we don't have to do that. If you want to know about a policy, go read it. I'm like, are you kidding? And then there was always people in my classroom and and people would make, they would observe me. They'd look at my test scores. They'd look at student data and what interventions are you doing? And there's a lot more red tape around different things, which I think makes sense because you're dealing with children and stuff like that. But in the university, like the faculty, that I work with, they don't really have a lot of those limits or, or bounds or evaluations or things of that nature. So the university is a little more hands-off and academic freedom and stuff like that, which is good and bad because you don't have no like PLC happening. You have no real like data-driven, how did my students do with this? Oh, well, let me, let me change that. You know, it's not quite as student-centered, I would say, but Anyway, I, I feel a lot more free, the scheduling and the office environment and everything, the way that they do their funding and all that stuff. It, it feels a little bit more um, breathing room, I guess you could say. But at the same time, it is a public institution and you know, we have our fair share of challenges as well. In the place where I'm at, I don't really have to deal with a lot of that type of stuff. You know. Thanks for the insights. That's great. Yeah. Um, our next question is from DKC1299. He is actually an instructional designer in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And his question was, what made you stay in the education field rather than pursuing corporate or government positions? That's a really good question. Because like I said, when I did enter the master's, they kind of said, you need to figure out fairly early on which of these degrees you want to get at the end of this program. And uh, I was kind of overwhelmed at first, like, well, geez, I don't know. I I could see myself doing any of these things. These are all interesting to me. I love the idea of being in a corporate or private sector where uh, sky's the limit and you can make money and all that kind of stuff. But I also love the stability and and, uh, kind of consistency of the public education world. The other really cool perk is that the Utah retirement system that the school district used is the same one that the university system uses. So all the years that I worked for the school district have are I'm continuing to build on that as far as building a pension and things of that nature. So it's not like cool insight. Yeah. If I if I had gone into the private, my pension would have been for only those eight years or whatever and been pretty measly. But now I'm able to kind of build on that. And so since I was already in public, it makes more a little more sense to stay in public sector, at least until the point where like I feel like, you know, I'm in a position where I can leave that and be okay. But but it, yeah. what it really came down to though for me was like, I could go and work for an airline or something and make instructional design that teaches people about their seat belts and how their seat becomes a life preserver in the case of a crash or whatever. Or I could go and work for Bed Bath & Beyond and do training videos on how to sell people soap or whatever. But I don't, I, for me, I have a very strong sense of purpose And I want to help people learn to improve their lives. And to me, that is elementary education to me was that's like the most core. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that as far as influencing the lives of children to set them on a path and while they're developing and maturing. 
but with uh, university, you've got these students that are seeking a better life through education and they want to learn to get a degree, to get a good job. I want to be involved in that path from the K through uh, graduate, whatever, somewhere in, in that system, that pipeline. I want to help people to become educated and to better their lives in that regard, not just teach people about how to use a life jacket or sell stuff or whatever. To me, the corporate world was more of that. I understand that there are corporate, you know, educational services. So, you know, like Pearson or other really big education companies that provide materials or textbooks or services or tools or apps or whatever. And I, that would be my second choice is I would want to work for one of those types of companies that creates learning technologies that goes to students directly. But again, I want to be influencing students in K through 12 or in, in college. I don't want to just be working with consumers as my audience or customers or whatever. Like I want to be involved in the education world. So, also, we wanted to stay in this area and Dixie yeah. they had, you know, the opportunity right. for him. Yeah. Otherwise we'd have to move probably. Exactly. So I looked at other like corporate jobs and stuff, but it just wasn't enough, I guess, to to win me over. And as I said, I'm open minded and perhaps in the future I will do that. But at this point it made the most sense for me to stay with the education system and that's kind of where my heart is. I really believe in public education and sending kids to school, kids it's a way that we promote community and democratic values and all sorts of stuff like that. So I'm it's clear, a big believer it's very in that. clear that you're passionate about the people, you know, and about education. And I love that. I admire that. I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. Our last question is from Jack Attack O, 1987. And she says, I'm a new mom in a new city who's trying to find a hustle and get a job in instructional design after teaching for seven years. She said, what kind of learning path would you recommend for an elementary school teacher making the switch to instructional design, networking, resume tips, et cetera? Mm -hmm. What would you recommend? Yeah, well, we've, we've mentioned there's a lot of different avenues you can go. If you wanted to go with kind of the university or community college route, as far as kind of an immediate hustle, one thing that I found that I, I had no idea this existed, but there's uh, these standards that courses have to meet. And so universities will send their courses to these reviewers. And at least with the set of standards we've used, it's called QM, Quality Matters. They have a rubric and they have uh, trainings that you can do to become a QM certified reviewer. And you get paid, I think, like $250 per review. It probably takes you four to six, maybe eight hours to review an entire course. So I don't know if that, that might be one that you could look into getting certified to do that and just start, you know, connecting with anybody. We send our courses all over the place to all sorts of different people to get reviewed. So that's kind of a cool little side job that I think, you know, if I was still back in the hustle mode, I might try and do more of that as well. A lot of people will teach adjunct. I know quite a few teachers that were in my district that started teaching adjunct and then that's kind of a way to get connected. So several of the education professors are also involved in the school district. So that's another thing that you might find if they have a continuous posting or a pool they're trying to make of possible part-time instructors at a local community college or university or something like that. Online courses. Yeah. And teaching online, especially as a, as a working mom, like that would help because then you can do that at your schedule, at, you know, whenever you have the time to do that. There are ways that you can become kind of like an online certified teacher. So if you look into stuff like that, we have in our district an online school. And I know that they're hiring people to, to work with students, K through 12 students online. I don't know if they require certain schedules or not, but my guess is it might be a little more flexible that way. There are certain universities that will hire online teachers from out of state. There's a few at uh, Dixie State that teach or other universities, just one class online, you know, all over the country or whatever. So that's another way you could kind of look into that. As far as instructional design, when I started with Dixie State, it was as a contract employee. So he might've even done that without my master's degree. I don't know. 
because really what it comes down to is just what you produce these deliverables. And if you do good work and you kind of know what you're doing, you have an eye for it, you understand the learning theory. And that's what teachers offer. In fact, all three of the designers they've hired so far have been former teachers. So they're very marketable. And I was part of the hiring committee for the second two designers. So they hired me and then I got to help them interview and hire two more people with the same position as me. And we were going through the different resumes. And I can tell you that not just for me, but for my supervisor, my director, for the other people that were on the hiring committee, K through 12 education experience was like one of the biggest things that we said, person knows what they're doing. They understand how people learn versus somebody that says, oh, I've worked at, as a manager here and a computer technician here. And now I just got my master's in instructional design, you know, management experience, whatever, pa. Computer skills, that's a little better, but teaching skills and education skills and learning design, curriculum design. As a teacher, you do all of that. And so you already have a lot of those built in skills. And we found that to be super helpful. So um I'm so glad I'm so glad you shared that. Cause I think for for some of our audience and some of the teacher field, they feel like, oh, I'm I'm just a teacher. Yeah. Whatever. I thought You're that a pedagogy rock star. Exactly. And that's a valued thing more valued almost outside of the classroom than it is inside where they just kind of take it for granted. Like, you know, you, yeah, you know, all this and you know how kids learn, but at a university, they're like, (laughs) something I found is that they don't really lot, not a lot of faculty or teachers or professors or even staff know about teaching and learning. They're just experts in their field. Right. Which is funny because incredibly well. Right. But it's a teaching university. We don't do a lot of research. You'd think like we'd have really, really, emphasis on teaching and learning and at this point you know they're kind of working towards that and that's why i think that they want to bring on a lot of former teachers because i don't just make those courses for the faculty i also kind of teach them how to be a teacher and like you know explain to them the value of an objective and an assessment (laughs) Uh, you know or that's kind of foreign to some of these people and so anyway but back to like kind of getting your foot in the door if you were just to kind of approach them and say as i'm a professional teacher Here on my resume, you want to put things like curriculum design. I've designed assessments. I teach based on data, you know, that I've collected through these assessments. I know how to write clear objectives that use Bloom's taxonomy verbs and all those kind of things that you kind of feel like, I'm just a teacher and that's all I'll ever be. But to them, they're like, oh, wow, you, you understand backward design and uh, universal design and all, and you understand learning theory. Wow. we, We don't really have anyone here around that knows that type of stuff. So. Um, right or presenting it in that way these words before that's amazing yeah yeah Yeah, so i think just offering your services and maybe even just i don't know volunteering to work on a project or say hey do you want a teacher to review something that you've been working on i'd be happy to just give feedback if someone approached me right now from the school district and said i'm willing to give you five hours a week where i just look through and click through all of your courses and tell you what i think and give you feedback i would love it i would pay for that in a heartbeat and then if if that started and we had that relationship then who do you think we're going to talk to when we have the next job you know what i mean so anyway just kind of finding the right people to talk to and kind of being friendly and persistent and offering your help i don't know stuff like that it's great these are amazing insights thank you so much for this but before we wrap it up is there Do you have two teacher transition tips, you know, tips for teachers that are making their move? What would you recommend? So the first one, Tiana kind of mentioned this, is that sacrifice. There's got to be a trade-off when you make that change. And yeah, if you haven't really reached that point yet, then, you know, then don't do it. If it's not, if it doesn't feel right, if you feel like it's not worth it to make that change, then just don't do it and stay where you're at. But if you've reached the point where maybe you feel overworked or maybe you feel a little bit disenfranchised with the system or the kids are just, you're not as young as you used to be and you want something more, maybe it's finances. Just know that there's going to be that trade-off and that there's going to be things that you'll miss. But if, if you feel that it's worth it, then go for it. And it is possible. It might not seem like it right away, but you just have to kind of find, you know, that niche or, or that value that you can bring somewhere else. And then yeah, I don't know as far as the second. Like when you stopped guitar teaching to do your contract work for Dixie, that was a bit of a risk because he was only contracted to do one project. 
And he kind of looked at it and was like, I need, you know, to stop teaching guitar so I have the time to do this project. Because if I do the project really well, then they'll give me more projects. So you've got to right. be willing to take a little bit of risk, which is scary when it comes to, you know, being able to support your family, giving up a, you know, a job like that, but it was worth it. Yeah. So yeah, being willing to kind of step out of your comfort zone a little bit. I don't know. And, and I think one of the other big things is that you just need to know that it is possible that there are a lot of other educators out of there that have gone through it and that they've done it. And that the, the skill set that you have is valuable outside of just the classroom. Mm -hmm. and that's hard to imagine. And you do kind of put yourself in this box, but there are a lot of people out there. I mean, even like Google and Amazon are starting to get into like learning stuff, you know, learning design and offering courses. And stuff. Well, who's going to design all this? They're going to need a ton of people. And teachers have that skill set already of understanding learning because I don't know, it's not, it's not just a given, like you don't just know if you've ever watched some of your substitute teachers or other people try and teach kids, like, you know, it's not natural to understand learning and, and good teaching and stuff like that. So there are a lot of other places where you can excel and make a living. So I think you just have to see also maybe what some of your other interests are and see if there's a way you can kind of combine that. So maybe you really love outdoor recreation. Maybe you really love fitness. I'm sure there are places where they have instruction or, or materials education for those fields and they need people to design it because most of them just know how to lift weights. They don't know how to <laughs> teach people about lifting weights or whatever, you know. But anyway, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and hope that there are people that can listen to some or part of this that maybe spark something, an idea. And I'm totally open if other people want to contact me or ask any other yeah. questions. Do you have, how would they go about getting in contact with you? I have an email through the, the university, ethan.decuster at dixie.edu that you can email. And can you spell that for them? <laughs> Sorry. The story of my you life, get it all the time. No problems. Ethan, E T H A N <laughs> dot D Custer, D E C E U S T E R. At and we'll put that in the show notes yeah. so that everyone has that. Sure. From, from my personal side, I've just got to say it's really been a privilege. The fact that you reached out years ago when you were starting to consider other options professionally and just that. You know, every everyone loves to be helpful, and I'm I'm so glad that it was helpful to any degree to offer insights about instructional design field and trying something yeah, else. I just and um, I just I really appreciated that you reached out recently and said how well it's going, and that your family bought a house and that that things are just good for you. It really made me yeah so happy. I yeah. just yeah. That's thank the thing you. is it's I. Privilege. I just needed to know that it was possible. And I, as someone in the Washington district said he knew you and that you were working at this whatever company. And I thought, oh, wow. I still thought she was teaching fifth grade up in Spanish Fork. And this is exactly what I was thinking about doing. So I reached out and, and you were very kind to, to share some words of encouragement. And that just convinced me like, you know, I can do this. This is possible. This is a real life person. I know Allie and she made it work. She's done it. And so Anyway, so then I went through this whole thing and um, wanted to share some gratitude for your words of encouragement those years before. And yeah, like you said, it's it's already taking root. And here I am, not even a year at this new job. And my wife and I are achieving one of our dreams, which is to build our own home. And, you know, it's not this huge, elaborate mansion, but it's ours. And we really love the process. And it wouldn't be possible, or maybe it would have been possible 12 years from now. <laughs> Anything, but now within the first year, we've been able to achieve that goal. And that's been just a tremendous blessing. So anyway, that's um, amazing. yeah. And then just to turn it over to Tiana, I, I know for me, I wasn't married at the time while I was transitioning out of teaching, but my roommates, you know, they were there and some of my closest friends were there and so supportive. So thank you for the role that I know that you've been for Ethan. Is there anything that you would like to share in wrapping it up with our audience as well? No, it's just, I, I think transitioning from any job to a new career is hard. So yeah, just encouraging them and being there for them. And yeah, yeah. And Tiana, she never at any point made me feel guilty. 
you know, that whole, oh, I'm a sellout or, oh, I'm not there for my kids. She never, ever made me feel that way. She was always so supportive and I can do it, Ethan. There are plenty of nights where I was like, I'm just not going to do this assignment because I'll still get a B <laughs> or whatever, you know, and I just, I just need a break room. And she's like, nope, get in there. You, you can do this and I believe in you and you're a good, you're a good, hardworking man. And we, me and the kids, we love you and we support you and everything. And she's always tells me how proud she is of me. And, and maybe doing... taking the kids away for a couple hours, so they can work on homework or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Give them some quiet time every once yeah. in a while. No, she's been really way to be a team. You guys. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you again so much for being willing to share your path and your insights and advice and examples, really. I know I know those who are listening really appreciate it. And just thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Take been care, a pleasure. guys. Thanks. Okay. You too. If you want to open new opportunities for your future with your teaching skills, then enroll in our course from teacher to instructional designer. This is so much more than just an online course. You will finish the course ready to confidently apply to jobs with a resume and cover letter that are already created for you with customizable templates and with your personal portfolio that showcases the instructional design skills you already have and those that you will gain through the course. You'll receive a professional development certificate that you can share with your school for PD hours. And you'll also have the option to get a certificate in instructional design and instructional development that you can showcase on your resume. On top of that, I'll show you the best places to find the kind of job you want. And our whole community is here to support you in our private course member only group. So your future is calling. Are you ready to answer? Go to teachertransition.com forward slash ID and sign up now. Don't put this off. There's a limited time coupon code that's on the checkout page and it won't be there for long. So sign up now. Let's get you and your incredible gifts on their way to the future opportunities where you're needed. This episode may have ended, but connecting doesn't have to. Join us on Facebook or Instagram and get the support and inspiration you need in your personal educator path. If you're loving the podcast, help us spread the word. Leave a review or screenshot the episode, share it on social media, and be sure to tag us at Teacher Transition. Who knows? We may even feature what you share on our social media feed too. Until next time, teacher friends, be sure to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the upcoming episodes. Good luck with the great things you're up to right now and keep looking forward to the amazing things to come.